I can give you a little bit, just a little bit, on global warming and yeah. Yeah. global warming. So we're going to, since this is a democratic republic, though not in the East German sense, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to take a vote. Hands up all those who would like Moncton to shut up now. Hands up all those who would like him to bang on about global warming. I think that vote, is there anybody who wants to abstain? No, no, no. there are no, 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 no. Yes, so you have something to say? Questions will happen at the end because people will want to hear all my uh, magic words and then those who need to run away and escape can do so once I finish speaking. Those who are really uh, endurance freaks, they can stay on and I'll answer your questions until the dawn comes, if that's what you would like. <laughs> because you're such a charming and agreeable audience, give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> Well, now, we're going to move on then, if I may, from that subject, which I was asked to do in detail, so if I bored you, tough luck. <laughs> and we're going to move on to global warming, so can we have the next uh, slide, please? Thank you very much. Right, so what we're going to look at, first of all, is the illogic of climate hysteria. Picture to yourself, if you will, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change at the UN. Pause for booze and hisses. Um, now, this organisation would not call a spade a spade because it doesn't do simple. No, no. It would call it a one-person operated, manually controlled, foot-powered implement of simple and robust yet adequately efficacious lignometallic composition, designated primarily, though by no means exclusively, for utilization on the part of hourly paid operatives deployed in the agricultural, horticultural, or constructional trades or industries as the case may be, for purposes of carrying out such excavational tasks or duties as may, from time to time, be designated by supervisory grades as being necessary, desirable, expedient, acquisite, or germane, with regard to the ongoing furtherance of the task or objective in hand, or on the other hand, underfoot, Secretary General. <laughs> you will be pleased to learn that for the rest of this evening, I propose to talk in plain English. <laughs> so let's have the next slide. What we're going to look at is something which is within my field of expertise. Because you know, a lot of the people who comment on uh, what I've had to say about global warming say this man has no qualifications to utter on this subject at all. He's just a charlatan, he's a quack. You can read the Climate Gate emails. They call me a charlatan, the Climate Gate emails. I was quite hurt, really, and then I realised who it was that was making the accusation, and I was rather pleased. <laughs> but here, are going to, what I'm going to do is to look at the 12 most common fallacies in human discourse, logical fallacies, errors in the process of an argument, that were first written down by Aristotle 2,300 years ago in his sophistical Refutations. Some of you are too young to remember that far back. So <laughs> what I'm going to do is to go through some of these fallacies with you as they are being used by those who are trying to tell us that global warming, in the defiance of the evidence, is a global crisis or might become so. And the first of these arguments is, of course, and you have to do most of these arguments in kind of baby language, because intellectually that's what they are, they're intellectual baby talk. There's a consensus. <laughs> well, even if there was, which there isn't, that would still tell us nothing whatsoever about whether or not that which there is said to be a consensus about is true or not. Science is not done by headcount. It never has been, but it never will be. And the founder of the scientific method in 11th century Iran, Abu Ali ibn al haytham said this about consensus. He said, the seeker after truth, and that was his beautiful name for the scientist, the seeker after truth, the theme of this evening, the seeker after truth does not place his faith in any mere consensus, however venerable. Instead, he subjects what he has learned of it to his own hard-won scientific knowledge and to scrutiny 
investigation, inspection, inquiry, checking, checking, and checking again. The road to the truth, said Al Haysan, is long and hard, but that is the road we must follow. So there's no place whatsoever for consensus in science. As your wonderful author now sadly died, I spoke to him just a few weeks before he did, Michael Crichton put it to me once on the telephone. He said, if it's science, it isn't consensus. If it's consensus, it isn't science. And the reason why it isn't science is that it is a logical fallacy, which is the headcount fallacy, which was given a Latin name, as all these fallacies were, by the medieval schoolmen. And this one is called the argumentum ad hoc. It's a fallacy. And the moment I heard that 95% of all the arguments that are put forward in favor of worrying about global warming are arguments from consensus of some kind or another, I realized that we were in fallacy territory, and therefore I'd better start to look a bit closely at the underlying science, which we'll do a little later on. But first, we're letting you in gently by doing a few more fallacies first. So let's have a look at the next one, please, Gary. Here we are. They say, oh yes, but maybe we can't use the consensus argument anymore because Moncton's gone around telling us we mustn't. But the fact is that all the scientific societies around the world, they all say that global warming is a terrible crisis and please can we have more grants. And, and so it's, it's a consensus of experts and we have to defer to the experts. And I even heard it fatuously said by a scientist one day at a conference I was speaking at, we just have to believe in the models. Well, hey, I'll believe in Raquel Welch any day. <laughs> but, but computer models, no way are they. So what is this fallacy then? The fallacy of relying upon the experts to establish what science is true and what is not is the argumentum ad vericundium. It's the reputation fallacy. Just because somebody has a reputation doesn't mean they're acting in accordance with it. Doesn't mean they deserve it anyway. And even if they are trying to get stuff right and acting in accordance with it, they may simply be wrong. So the fact that we are told things by the experts doesn't mean that the experts are right. And indeed, the experts in the British scientific body, which is the Royal Society, founded by King Charles II, the oldest publicly funded pressure group for more money in the world, they have now changed their stance on this. And previously, under their uh, old friend of mine, their Marxist president, Martin Rees, the astronomer royal, terribly nice man, but his politics are all over the place, they had put out very extreme statements about global warming. They've now retracted them and put out a much more reasoned and much more sensible document. It's still not quite right. But it's much closer to what I, as best I can make it out, consider to be the sign. So we'll go on to another one. And this is, well this is a good one, we can't explain warming unless we imagine that carbon dioxide added to the atmosphere by us is causing all that warming because it has a very large effect. Now that is the fallacy of argument from ignorance. We don't actually know why the warming that began in 1695 about 50 years before the Industrial Revolution even began, happened. We think it was because, at that time, the absence of sunspots on the sun for 60 years was coming to an end, the sun was becoming more active, and the weather began to warm up, and it's still doing it to this day. There's been 300 years of global warming, nearly all of which is nothing to do with us. So this is what's known as the fallacy of argument from ignorance. You don't know what's causing a given phenomenon, so you label it as our fault. Well, that is the argumentum ad ignorantium. Let's have another one. Warming is accelerating, they say, and simply because it is accelerating, therefore, we are the cause. Now, if warming is accelerating, to introduce the idea that we are the cause, without any evidence, is to introduce a red herring. So this is the red herring fallacy, the ignoratio elenchi. It's an ignorance of the basic manner in which an argument should be conducted. And it's a very important fallacy because it's a very frequent one. You have to watch out for it all the time. Let's have a look at another one. You're going to enjoy this one. And this again has to be done in baby language. What about the cuddly polar bear? Well, I'll tell you what about the cuddly polar bears. They're about 16 foot high. And if you meet one on a dark night, it's like 
Gary here, only about twice the size. <laughs> and it will eat you if it's hungry. So they're not cuddly. <laughs> and that's the fallacy of inappropriate pity. That doesn't mean that pity is always inappropriate. What it does mean is that if you've got a population of polar bears that's five times larger than it was in the 1940s, hardly, as you may think, the profile of a species is imminent threat of extinction, then you say to yourself, well, maybe we don't need to pity the polar bears. And so all this talk about how the polar bears are an endangered species, as a recent court case in your Supreme Court decided, clearly this has no foundation in objective fact. Let's have a look at another one. We add CO2 to the air, CO2 causes warming. So observed warming is down to us. They keep restating this kind of argument in several different ways. This particular one is the fallacy of false cause. And the particular instance of that fallacy that we see here is the post hoc ergo proctor hoc sub fallacy. That is just because something happens after something else, therefore it was caused because something else happened. That is not necessarily the case. There may be a correlation or there may not. Or there may be something that caused both phenomena, which is completely separate from either of them, or it may be entirely random. And so this is a fallacy to try to argue, as you see there. And you'll see this argument quite a lot, you see it in the documents of the IPCC. This is the kind of depressingly poor science that we see, because if it's bad logic, it's bad science. Let's have a look at another one. We tell the models, including Raquel and Welsh, that CO2 causes a lot of warming. And then the computer models tell us that CO2 causes a lot of warming. So it's all our fault then. Well, that, of course, is a circular argument. An argument which is defined as circular because one of the premises is also the conclusion. So it's the argumentum ad petitionem principii, the begging the question argument. Now, what I hope you're beginning to feel by this stage is that you've heard these arguments recited by the left-wing media and the scientists and the boffins and the politicians over and over and over again. And now I hope you will see that every single one of these major arguments on which the entire case is built are arguments that have no justification in science or in fact because they are illogical. On we go. Warming makes hurricanes bad. <laughs> Katrina was very bad. So it was all our fault. Once again, the baby language is appropriate. This, of course, is from Al Gore's sci-fi comedy horror movie, <laughs> when he blamed it on Katrina, which happened at just the right time while he was putting the movie together. And this is the fallacy of accidents, the inappropriate argument from the particular, from the general, I'm sorry, to the particular argumentum ad dicta simpliciter, ad dictum secundum quid. The fallacy of action, the inappropriate argument from one to the other. On we go to another one. This is the fallacy of converse action. Arctic ice is melting, so it's all our fault. <laughs> well, the thing is that the Arctic ice may be melting, but the Antarctic ice is increasing and has increased by nearly enough to match the loss of ice in the Arctic. So therefore, we cannot say that this is global warming at all, because the Arctic has been cooling for 30 years. So once again, not only are the facts wrong, but the logic is also wrong. The Arctic ice would melt even if it was natural causes, and so we cannot, just because the ice is melting, say it is all, or even partly, our fault. It may be, on the other hand, it may not be, and to try to overclaim that it's our fault is to commit this fallacy of converse accident. And now another one. You're going to see some really glorious ones just coming up. Here is, here is one you like. Agree with us or he will haul you up before the International Climate Court. Ja, hol ja, spach hol ja. So this one is, of course, the argumentum ad baculum, the argument of force. Now you may think that even though I've tried to give you a measured and even presentation so far, suddenly I'm exhibiting a head that reaches in a marked point because I'm talking about an international climate court and surely there is no such thing and nobody has ever suggested one. Well, if only. Because I went to Durban last December and at Durban, which was the UN climate conference, they have one every year 
as long as the place they have it in has plenty of grass skirts and sangria and sand and sea and whatever the other third S is, that they, they, they have their conferences in these places. And this was Durban, South Africa. Lovely, hot, slightly humid temperature, very pretty surroundings. And of course, the first thing the UN did on seeing me turning up as an accredited delegate, accredited by them, was to say, you can't come in. We know what you'll do. You'll bust it up. <laughs> so I said, all right. And I went and hired a plane, and I jumped in by parachute from a height of 10,000 feet <laughs> and landed on the beach nearby, and it got into all the newspapers, and they couldn't keep me out after that because I had become tiresomely notorious. <laughs> so they got me in. <laughs> so they let me in after all, and I went to see them and gave them quite a wagging of the finger. I said, this is a British jurisdiction originally, and if you had tried to pursue this anymore, I would have had you in court, and if you think you're the UN, and therefore you're not subject to the courts, you are if you breach natural justice as you have here. Because even if you're an international organisation, you're still subject to it. Don't you ever do that again. Blah, 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 no, sir. <laughs> anyway, the argument was false. So I then went in to find out what was in the negotiating document that the conference was all about. They have these big documents, hundreds of pages long, which contain all the conclusions that the conference is supposed to come to. They spent months before them negotiating with this thing. And the reason why I wanted to see this document is that not one news medium anywhere in the world not even the Ventura County Stars, whose reporter has just left, um, had given any indication of what was in the negotiating document. So I went and got one, and here's what was in it, among other things. Rights of legal personality for Mother Earth. Mother Earth was going to have the right to sue. Uh, it wasn't quite clear who was going to sue in the name of Mother Earth, or whether she was going to shake herself up and sue on her own behalf, because these details are not for the grand international negotiator. Anyway, Mother Earth was going to have the right to sue <coughs> Western countries only, of course, in the International Climate Court. They were going to set up an International Climate Court, to which only Moncton and Western countries could be found guilty of it. <laughs> because we were daring to suggest there might not be a problem, so we could be taken in front of the International Climate Court. I mean, all of this is pointy-headed nonsense. And the reason why the world's news media hadn't mentioned it is they knew perfectly well it was pointy-headed nonsense, and they simply weren't prepared to report it or reveal what these mad negotiators were doing in our net. And then they were also gave just for fun to cut the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere from 400 parts per million to 200, whereupon quite a lot of the plants that you see around you would turn belly up and die. <laughs> and the critters and the humans that depend on them would curl up and die as well. This was a serious option in that document. So I wrote it up. I said, here is what your world government wannabes are doing now. And I put it on a blog at whatsupwiththat.com, W-A-T-T-S, upwiththat.com, a very good uh, site about climate science. And I said, this is what they're doing. And I listed these and about two dozen other completely barking mad proposals that we're in this <laughs> Within 24 hours, WordPress, which is the organization that handles all the 500,000 different blog postings every day, got in touch and they said, every day we tell the person whose blog posting has had more hits than any other on any other subject, any other of the 500,000. And he said, today, you're it. <laughs> this was number one. Why? Is it because I'm clever? Is it because my writing style is elegant and eloquent? Yes. <laughs> but the real reason, the real reason is, of course, that people really want to know stuff. They want to be told what is going on in the world. They do not want endless regurgitated Marxist gibberish. They want facts. And I had given them facts. I'd shown what these pointy heads in Durban were up to. And this was really interesting. And the result was electric. Within 24 hours of this posting going up, they had had to abandon half 
of the entire negotiating document. And all of these mad proposals, you'll be glad to hear, were among those that were dropped. So when Moncton speaks, not merely does the nation tremble, but all the nations of the earth. <laughs> But of course, I'm not letting it go to my head in the slightest degree. <laughs> so next slide, if you would, Gary, thanks. Uh, now, oh, this is a great one. Yeah. Moncton says he's a lord. Parliament clerk say he isn't. So he's wrong about the climate. <laughs> now, you only have to read that out to realise how dot is. And you'll see this all over the web. Well, first of all, shall I try to prove that I am a lord. Let me see. Yes, here we are. Who has got a nice, clear reading voice and reasonably good eyesight? Anybody? You, sir. Come on. Now, will you kindly read out to the committee the words in that box there? This box right here. Yeah. The holder is the um, is the right honourable Christopher Walter. What's that? Viscount. Uh, Viscount. Viscount. Vi Viscount. I mispronounced that. Consider Michael. yourself executed. <laughs> <laughs> Moncton of... Brinsley. Very Brinsley. good, yes. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> yes. yes. Ladies and gentlemen, you are indeed in the presence of greatness, <laughs> but in my case, only in heritage. <laughs> <laughs> On we go. One more. You're really going to enjoy this one. I thought I had to show you this. This is something you can do at home. <laughs> you know, often they say don't do this at home. This one I do at home. It's such fun. You type in Moncton Liar into Google and you will get 4.7 million hits <laughs> in 2.3 seconds. Obama's got four. <laughs> so, so there you are. This is, uh, I think you will, will, will say, a very satisfactory result. And uh, I call this, incidentally, the argumentum ad <laughs> And one of two uh, consequences follow from this. Either your speaker tonight is one of the most mendacious people on the planet, after your president, of course, <laughs> or he has really got up the noses of people with a lot of money and a lot of determination to destroy his reputation because of what he is saying. And I incline, as you might think, towards the latter view. <laughs> on we go. Right, now we're going to look very quickly at what is happening in the climate and what is here go. <coughs> waity, waity. There you go. I have to give him another cigar. Right, so here we have the ocean heat content. Now this is a very important quantity when you're trying to work out how fast global warming is happening. And the reason why is that the oceans are a huge heat sinker. So if they are warming up, then maybe the planet really will warm up one day. And here is what was predicted by uh, NASA's court jester, James Hansen. And this is what the IPCC uses as its forecast. It's four and a half times greater than what is actually observed by the 3,000 Argo bathysthenograph bullet that measure the temperature and salinity of the oceans all over the world. Admittedly, these buoys are the equivalent of taking a single temperature measurement in Lake Superior, which is a very big lake, less than once a year. So the fact is that here, as in much else of climate science, the data we have available to us are simply not reliable or complete enough to draw definitive conclusions, but the best evidence we have, such as it is, is that the IPCC has over-predicted that one four and a half times over. Next. This is sea level, measured by the Envisat satellite, a very inconvenient satellite because it shows that in the eight years that it's been sending us calibrated data, it's just stopped actually a few weeks ago, it's finally died, and we hope that it was uh, natural causes and not murder. <laughs> uh, it shows that in the last year that we've just had, sea level was lower than in any of the previous seven years. Now, here's a question for the audience. How many of you have seen that fact reported in any mainstream newspaper? No, it's not one. But it's good news, isn't it? You know, we're told that sea level is going to rise. Again, the court jester has the figure, 246 feet. Al Gore says 20 feet. The IPCC says a maximum of two feet. Best estimate, one foot five, over a century. 
But how much is it warming out per century over the last eight years? Let's have a look. 1.3 inches per century. But they haven't told you that either, have they? On we go. Hurricanes. The least activity in 30 years. The entire satellite record, the last two years, we've had the least hurricane activity in 30 years. They don't tell you that either. Instead, you see endless pictures of tropical depression beryl or cheryl or whatever you could call it. It's funny how they name so many of these after women, isn't it? <laughs> um, but this depression caused very little damage. There were some floods here and there, power out, did much as you often get in these things. But it frankly wasn't worth the acres and acres of coverage it got and the usual suggestions about how this is global warming, this is the first time we've seen a tropical storm this early since 100 years ago, and all that kind of stuff. Fact is, here's the overall record from all around the world, and that's what it looks like, and it's not particularly terrifying, is it? Let's have a look at some more. Here is the extent and trend of global sea ice, the extent in blue, it jiggles up and down. Frankly, if you had a heartbeat as regular as that, you would be regarded as a very healthy little planet. <laughs> and the trend tailing off just a little bit globally over the last few years, but nothing really to write home about. Nothing that goes in any way beyond the natural variability of the climate. And it may be that we have contributed a bit to this slight declining trend in these last few years, but no more than that. On we go. Ah, yes, me so. I was uh, with Congressman Sensenbrenner at a climate conference just uh, earlier this week. And he said he had been fighting very hard to make sure that we didn't introduce a cow for tax. He didn't want a cow for tax because he said there was really no need for it. He's quite right. Because what happened was that once the Russians had plugged up all the holes in that massive, long, Soviet methane pipeline that runs all the way from Siberia to Western Europe. Putin went along with his duct tape and chewing gum and filled up all the holes. He did this because he worked out that every cubic foot of gas that farted out of that pipeline where it shouldn't was a cubic foot of gas he couldn't overcharge Europe for. So he went around and fixed it. And look what happened then. Methane hardly rising. It's risen by 20 parts per billion in the last 10 years. Per billion, not per million, per billion. And that would cause, even if all the methane stayed in the atmosphere, which it doesn't, but heat raises the CO2 quite quickly, one 350th of a Celsius degree of warming, or about one 200th of a Fahrenheit degree. So we don't need a care for our tax, you'd be glad to hear. <laughs> on we. And here, finally, on the, the what's actually happening in the climate, is the IPCC, again this UN climate panel, over-predicting how much global warming is going to occur. They made a forecast in 1990, high, medium and low rates of warming. The black is what actually happened. And it's below the very lowest rate of warming that their precious models said was at all likely. How many of you have seen that reported in any mainstream news media? Because the drainstream media just won't report this stuff. They won't even remind you, as I will, that your National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, one of the cheerleaders for global warming, that's been going on and on and on about it, said in their State of the Climate report in 2008, when there'd been almost 10 years, in fact, more than 10 years, without any global warming, they said, <coughs> well, you'd have to wait 15 years without any global warming before you could say that the models were wrong and the scare was over. Well, hello, Mr. Carl. We've now had 15 years without global warming. So the science is in. The truth is out. The game is up. Al Gore is through. And the scare is officially over. On we go then. We're now going to look at why it is that they got this so wrong. They got it wrong because they wanted a particular result and they invented an argument which had absolutely no scientific basis. And then they said, yes, I can thank you. So we're going to look at the argument and I'm going to have to give you an equation warning here. 
because there will be some equations. But don't worry, I'll do them for you, I'll give you the answers, all you have to do is believe. <laughs> no you don't, because that's not how science is done. How much you like the guy who's talking to you, you do not just believe it. You check and check and check again. And I shall receive your check at the earliest possible <laughs> Now, here we go then. Uh, we're going to look at, this is the Drake equation. Now, some of you may have heard of this. Yes, these are Drake's here, and of course they have Viscount's coronets, as they do on my estate. Everybody has to be properly dressed. And this equation is, it's a, a bogus equation, actually. It's produced by a guy who wanted to try to work out what was the likelihood that we would be able to detect radio signals from civilizations elsewhere in the galaxy. Yep, we're in Star Wars territory here, folks. That's what the equation looks, at, looks like. Just look at the image of it. Now, I'm not going to go through it with you, but basically all of the terms on the right-hand side of that equation multiplied together give you the answer, which is the number of civilizations whose radio signals we should be able to detect. Trouble is, all of those quantities on the right-hand side of the equation are unknown and unknowable, unmeasured and unmeasurable. This equation is not fit for its purpose. It is about as genuine as a certain birth certificate I might mention. <laughs> and now what? Here's another equation. I call this the quack equation. <laughs> a quack being somebody who makes up potions and nostrums and notions and silly ideas. Here, we're trying to work out how much warming will we be get after the climate settles down in 3,000 years to equilibrium as a result of our perturbing it to the extent of doubling the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere? Now, this is actually the equation that they use. Trouble is, all of the terms on the right-hand side of the equation, just after the equal sign there, are unknown and unknowable, unmeasured and unmeasurable. The first two of those terms the first of them, the radiative forcing from doubling CO2, has been reduced by 15% by the IPCC already, because even they have begun to realise there's too much egg in the pudding. <laughs> then the Planck parameter, lambda zero there, they've just done some measurements on the moon which show that the lunar equivalent of lambda zero had been overstated in the textbooks by an impressive 35%. And if there was even just half as much overstatement of the terrestrial equivalent, then on that ground alone, the IPCC would have overstated global warming by 50%. And those two are the ones we know most about. And if you multiply those two together, you get a not particularly terrifying one Celsius of warming per doubling of CO2 concentration, and you only get that much if you wait 3,000 years for it. <laughs> Now, this wasn't enough to give them a problem. So they said, well, if you change the temperature by an external perturbation, then there's a force, like the sun gets hotter, or the uh, Earth's electricity gets all the changes, or we put CO2 into the atmosphere, which will cause some warming, then this warming will be multiplied by three, because all of these terms, when you work it all out, you get the Planck parameter back in here, lambda zero, and then you get all these other terms, these feedbacks, as they're called. These, they say, will multiply the warming by three. But again, not one of these feedbacks can be measured, not even close, not even actually by ballpark. We don't know. They can't be distinguished from one another, as I have tried to distinguish them here. They can't be distinguished from the original perturbations or forcings that first caused them. There is absolutely no basis for saying that just because we cause that little warming of the atmosphere by adding CO2 to it, that you can multiply it by three or anything like three. It might even be that these feedbacks are negative and actually bring down the warming we cause. We do not even know the sign of this term in red. Here are the official values for these um, uh, things in the equation. Can we have the next slide, Gary, thank you. Here we are, the official values, I won't go through with them, but you will be tested on them later. <laughs> Next slide. Next slide. And so here it is. The radiative forcing unmeasurable, Planck parameter unmeasurable, all the feedbacks unmeasurable that make that term G up there, all unmeasurable. We don't know. 
for the warming at two times CO2 is unknowable by any scientific method that involves prediction. We can't do it that way. It is impossible by any method. So how can we do it? In three words, wait and see. <laughs> <laughs> On we go, please go. So here is the reason why we think that feedbacks, we skeptics that is, think that feedbacks are not strongly net positive, either they don't amplify the warming. The main reason is this. Let's go to the next slide. Here is what's called the climate sensitivity curve. And what I've got in here is the amount of warming you get per doubling of CO2 concentration, depending upon what is called the feedback loop gain, the closed loop gain. I shall be expecting essays from all of you on the closed loop gain uh, later. But the point is that what you would normally expect in a, an object which is behaving in a stable fashion is that this green zone along here is where you would expect to find the feedbacks to be. Very, very slightly positive at most, but more likely negative, probably somewhere around here is my best guess. And therefore you get a warming of a not particularly dizzy 0.5 to 1.3 Celsius. That's about 2, Celsius, 2 Fahrenheit at maximum after 3,000 years per doubling of CO2 concentration. That's the most likely answer. But here, in fantasy land, is the IPCC's range of temperature estimates, 2 to 4.5 Celsius. That's the zone in which they say the loop gains will be, around 1.7 to uh, nearly 4. Now, this is completely, uh, uh, to, sorry, I should say 0.4 to 0.8, I should say, the loop gain. So this is fantasy land, because if it were there, then you might suddenly get this happening. You suddenly get the temperature really soaring as the feedbacks multiply in upon themselves in a catastrophic way. And this is what they call runaway feedback. That's why they say we can't really tell whether we're going to get 3 Celsius of warming, their best estimate, or even as much as 10 or 11. That's why they say that. But there is no basis for this. The entire basis for it is purely fiction. Here's why. There is what I call the process engineer's limit. Realistically, the feedback, uh, the feedback loop gain cannot exceed what's called 0.1. And yet here is the fantasy line. The reason why it can't exceed that is if you build an electronic circuit, any process engineer will tell you this. And you design in a feedback loop gain of more than 0.1, then you can get conditions happening which at some moment or another will cause the circuit to blow up as runaway feedback happens. And yet, as we now look, here is what happens. If you go well, there's the IPCC again, well beyond the process engineer's limit. Here's what happens if you cross the singularity in the feedback equation. Then suddenly, you get as negative a feedback, and therefore much cooling, as you had much warming before. Now, the climate simply hasn't oscillated in this way, and you can see why. Here, the temperature has been for the last 750 million years to some probability, and more or less clearly for the last uh, 64 million years, it hasn't varied by more than 3% either side of the long run mean. Now, 3% is 8 Celsius. It's enough to give you uh, uh, ice age at one moment and a hot house earth the next, but it is not enough for very large net positive feedback as assumed by the IPCC to occur. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is quite enough science for the season. <laughs> Give yourselves a round of applause for putting up this. <laughs> and here is what the IPCC itself says about all this. The long-term prediction of future climate states mm. is not possible. And then they go on to make all the absurd predictions of what's going to happen over the next 3,000 years. Whatever they're on, I'd like some. <laughs> on and on with Gary. Now we're going to look very briefly only, because we're coming close to the end now, you've been very patient, it's been a long presentation. We're going to look at whether it's more cost-effective to do something about global warming or to leave it alone. So here we go. The answer, very simply, is this. No policy to abate global warming by taxing, trading, regulating, reducing or replacing greenhouse gas emissions will prove cost-effective 
solely on grounds of the welfare benefit from climate mitigation. It simply doesn't pay. To put it still more eloquently, if I may, CO2 mitigation strategies that are inexpensive enough to be affordable will be ineffective. Strategies costly enough to be effective will be unaffordable. <laughs> Don't you just love it? So focus on that is better. Onward again. And here, in summary, is what I call the real precautionary principle, which we have in the insurance market in London. If the cost of the premium exceeds the cost of the risk, hey man, don't insure. <laughs> so it's actually better not to spend any money on global warming at all at present. Even if we were going to see as much global warming as the usual suspects say we will. It is still cheaper and more cost effective to do nothing now and to adapt in a focused way later. Leave it to future generations. They, on past form, will be richer than we are, though admittedly the world's financial institutions and the EU and the Fed are doing their best to make sure that is not the case. <laughs> Onwards we go. Finally, the moral question, very briefly. CO2, let's have another slide, is good for you. The more CO2 a nation emits per capita, the longer its people live. Because of the correlation. <laughs> this is true. That's true. Because CO2 is good for you. And CO2 emissions are directly correlated with prosperity. And the more prosperous you are, the longer you live. It works. Let's look at it the other way around. Child mortality reduces the more CO2. Your mission. So children live longer if you have more CO2 being emitted by your nation. Because again, there is this correlation between CO2 and prosperity, and it's the prosperity that allows you to have the hospitals and schools and etc. that lead to better health and longer life. So all of this is common sense actually, but oh my goodness, how seldom do you ever hear anyone say it? <laughs> Here's what happens if you get things wrong. <coughs> Now, even before the tragic earthquake in Haiti, where this photograph was taken, the poor people there, our fellow creatures of this planet, were living on mud pies made with real mud. And this is an outrage. This man, you can see, he's not particularly well fed. He is making these mud pies with real mud. You add a pinch of butter and a pinch of salt, and you mash it and mash it and mash it for hours and leave it to bake in the sun and you sell it to your neighbours for three US cents per mud pie, and they eat these mud pies to live. That's how poor some of our fellow creatures are. And what happened was that along came the biofuel scam, an offspin of the global warming scare, and what happened then was that world food prices in around 2007, and the years either side of it, suddenly doubled because we'd taken so many hundreds of millions of acres of agricultural land out of food production that the price went up. My love, you're looking terribly curved. I would put this jacket around you, but I'm wired into it, so I'm afraid I can't help you. Would you hug her and keep her warm? Thank you. And this is a tragedy, because the doubling of world food prices led to a doubling of the price of these mud plants. Starvation resulted, not only here, but in a dozen regions of the world. Food riots, which only happen when people are actually starving, happened in these dozen regions. Hardly any Western news medium bothered to report that the consequence of this global warming scam and the biofuel scam that came out from it was mass starvation, loss of life, and food riots. They didn't tell you that, did they? And it makes me angry. But here is one voice of sanity. Herr Jean Ziegler, the UN Right to Food Rapporteur, the only official that I shall retain in office when I sweep the UN and all its works into the Hudson. <laughs> he said this, when millions are going hungry, it is a crime against humanity. I'll say that again, his words, a crime against humanity, that food should be diverted to biofuel. And that is quite right. We shouldn't be playing these green so-called games because people are dying in very large numbers. You're getting villagers in Uganda being shot if they refuse to leave their home 
so that their villages and surrounding fields can be turned into a carbon sink and appear in some meaningless statistic on some UN international database. We have to grow up and stop killing our fellow men with this stupid global warming scare. On we go, this lady. This is what you could be doing with the hundred billion dollars your government has spent over the last 20 years on trying to make non-existent or very nearly non-existent global warming go away. It cost only eight dollars to save the site of this lady who had trichitis, which is a disease caused by the trachoma parasite, which causes the eyelashes to grow inward towards the eyeball, and the result of that is you eventually go blind. It is acutely painful in the meantime. Eight dollars was spent on curing this lady's sight. That is all it costs. You can send the money, if you like, to the Royal Commonwealth Society for the Blind, whose photograph this is. That's what we could be doing with the billions upon billions that we are utterly wasting on putting windmills and solar panels all over the place, killing every kite and kite hawk and eagle in California along the Altamont Pass. It is an outrage. And you are the people who are going to stop it by just quietly not being cowed by the left not being frightened by the media, just go on saying, oh, come off it. This is not only wrong, it is offensively wrong, it is in your face wrong, and it has got to stop. <laughs> we are the poor children of Africa. They look at you with their hopeless, hopeful eye. They need food now. They need clean water, now. Safe sewage disposal, now. Hospitals, now. Places to live that have fireplaces so they don't die of the smoke, now. Fossil fuels so they don't have to light fires, now. Electricity, now. They don't need these in a hundred years' time. They'll be dead in one year's time, unless they are helped now. And so what I would like to do is to refocus the one good point that has come out of this global warming scare, which is a willingness internationally to get together, albeit in places where grass skirts are plentiful, and cooperate for the first time on a truly global scale. But let's stop wasting that cooperation on the non-problem of global warming and refocus it on helping these children, on giving them the future that we have long been able to take for granted. So that really would be my final message. But this is the week of Memorial Day, and may I just say one or two things about your gallant armed forces. Of course, they fought against us to give you our independence. They fought against us when we tried to get our own back in the War of 1812. Ever since then, your gallant armed forces have fought alongside ours, shoulder to shoulder, in defense of the freedom and democracy and prosperity and success and pursuit of happiness and life and liberty that your founding fathers wanted you to have and you, God bless you, want the rest of the world to have. 3,000 of your armed forces have died in Afghanistan alone. On the wall that commemorates your Vietnam Veterans, there are 58,282 names. Your country has given its own lifeblood in defense of freedom and in the hope of spreading that blessed freedom to all the nations of the earth. Although George Santayana, the philosopher, once said of Britain that the world never had sweeter masters, Surely that kind thought applies in Spain to the United States. For your gallant heroes have been sent out by you because you want to make sure that the whole world shall be free. And so I pray for those of your gallant soldiers who alongside ours have lost their lives in the pursuit of freedom. And I recall the closing words of that great address 
on the battlefield of Gettysburg by your 16th President Abraham Lincoln when he said this, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. 